like Google are forcing the Europeans to regulatory hand. Companies like Amazon, for example, have mastered this part of tax evasion, or should we say tax optimization. So the question remains, can the EU stand up to these big tech companies? So here to talk about reining in on the power of big tech is Paul Tung. Our guest is an Uber alumnus. He studied and earned a PhD in economics there. Today, he's head of the tax committee, a prominent member of the European Parliament, and a face proponent of digital regulations. My name is Patrick, this is Casper, and the audio is hopefully working. And now let's have a warm round of applause for Paul Tan. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Paul. Great to have you here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're still figuring <laughs> out, but I think we should continue. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, how does it feel to be back at the Uber? Do a lot of things change since your days here? Well, I took my bike uh, and went across the canals and came here because this is what I did for many years, mm -hmm. having my office here in the F building, uh, working on my PhD, and then every day you could come here and along, take the bike along the canals. And this is, of course, what I miss traveling back and forth in Brussels or to anywhere. Uh, so I enjoy that. Yeah, you mentioned your PhD that you did here. Um, did you, back in the day, write that on a, on a laptop like we do? Did you write it on a PC or even a typewriter? No, no, it was an IBM computer, uh, large screen, black and white, uh, yeah. and all that. And, uh, I studied economics here, but when I did my undergraduate, I sort of realized I don't know, hardly know anything about economics, so I, need to, I wanted to study further, and yeah. uh, that my PhD was very helpful, yeah. uh, at least for me. It still, it, still, it still is, so it helps you to develop your thinking, and I still like to think that it also helps me in my political work, because you need to have a, a, a quick rough understanding of the issues at hand, and economic, my studies in economics, uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, still help me with that. Yeah. yeah, and I guess the technology has changed a lot as well. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about today would be... Yeah, but it, it's sometimes, you see that uh, technology changes, but it's also being used to confuse people, right? Yeah. So I'm now um, uh, enforced, a bit by accident, I would say, it was not my intention, enforced in discussions on crypto, um, I'm becoming the, quickly the number one enemy of the crypto sector. Um, so and you must they, be and putting in some good regulation if that's the, if that's the case. Uh, it's about regulation, of course. Um, uh, no one likes being taxed, no one likes being regulated. That's sort of the fate of a politician. Uh, but they confuse you with technology. Or as you start, even during your undergraduate study, economics is about, okay, it's about store of value, means of exchange. Yeah. You, you can start with the, the timeless concepts and still try to, and therefore try to understand how crypto works or should work. So. Yeah, and this pretty much leads us already to what we're talking about, um, that companies like Google, Amazon, or Facebook, they play an ever-increasing role in our lives, and keeping their power in check um, seems sometimes like a battle, David versus Goliath. Who is who in this analogy, do you think? Um, you, who is who in the analogy? But is it David or Goliath? I think, um, maybe that's not a good analogy. I think that, uh, for example, the European Union is, as a whole, as an institute, as a community, is as powerful as, uh, as Google and Facebook. However, we, we have chosen to ignore the, the, uh, the developments in digital technology for many years. It was a sort of laissez-faire policy. So now we have introduced regulation just this year, concluded this year. But the regulation before was from 2000. Facebook was not even initiated in 2000. So we, we were just keep, uh, we didn't, we ignored it and also enchanted by the, the story from Silicon Valley. We're here, we're innovative and we help to connect the world to what not. So it, we woke up late and then, uh, but then again, once we are in the game, we can beat uh, Google and Facebook if we want to. So basically it's Goliath versus Goliath. <laughs> Great. Yeah, you already mentioned that the big tech companies basically started in the early 2000s 
as for example Google did so as well. However, the first EU regulatory milestone, just like you said, the GDPR regulation, which affected the use of data protection and privacy, only came about in 2018. So, did it, you mentioned this already a little bit, but did it take the EU 18 years to understand Google's business model? <laughs> no, I think it was, uh, I, um, for example, we had a Dutch commissioner, Nelly Kroos, and she was absolutely not interested in, uh, in regulating, um, thinking this is a business, this is innovative, uh, you, can, uh, you should not come near those businesses and start to regulate them. So it, it's a change of thinking, and it's a change of thinking that you have not just seen in, uh, in Europe, you also see it in the US, by the way, so it's, it's a change and maybe it started with Cambridge Analytica, I think, which sort of made people very much aware of the issues at stake. But it has direct impact on our uh, democratic elections, in this case also the, re the, the Brexit referendum. And that, that changed, but it changed on both sides of the Atlantic. So, however, we have a very different approach in Europe. We are a legal community, and that's our main vehicle to, for change. Um, so we, Europe makes legislation, the Americans go to court. That's sort of the difference. So what you see is now that Lina Khan has been appointed of the FTC. You don't know, probably know Lina Khan, but hey, she's about 32 or 33. Done her PhD, I think. Uh, been very critical on, uh, on big tech. Or met, she started with critical articles on Amazon. And she's now been appointed by Biden, uh, and I think uh, Big Tech uh, is scared of what is happening in Brussels, but I think uh, the Big Tech is also scared by Lina Khan, uh, this, this, small, uh, this small, tiny lady with huge powers. So this, but it's very different. There they go to court. Uh, and could it also be one of the reasons is that um, well, legislators just need time to catch up uh, on these innovations, these trends, uh, Facebook and Google innovating uh, this technology? Is there enough technology, technological expertise within the EP, for example? Yeah, but this is the point I would like to make. Don't get fooled by technology. So they make it sound... They make it... Yeah, it was still working. They make it sound difficult, complicated, something you don't understand and you should not mess with in the first place, right? Um, whereas I started uh, to work on this, I also studied the business model of Google and Facebook. And that's, it's pretty simple if you look at the numbers. 98% uh, of the revenue from Facebook is from digital ads. So it's 98%. Google is 80% advertising. So once you realize that, okay, this is, the, this is the heart of the business model. How does this business model work? Well, in fact, and this is where I started my sort of attack on Google and Facebook, is they, um, they need to sell advertisement. Uh, so what do they need for advertisement? They need your attention. You're on your phone right now, right? So that's... Uh, <laughs> but this is what they want, so to say. They need your attention. That they need you to watch the screen. So how do they do that? Well, by many notifications, but also by many algorithms, what you see on the social media is all there to get and to keep all your attention. So what keeps your attention? Endless scrolling, I would say. Endless scrolling, but it's more than that. Usually, you would say sex sells, but these are American companies, they don't sell sex, but usually you would be interested in that. So, but they find the next best thing, or even a better thing, they sell disagreement, and preferably, vehement disagreement. They sell emotions. I'm against you. You are stupid, so to say. This is what you see on, on Twitter, on, but also on YouTube. It's all because it gets our attention. And then, so this is, so when you start to realize that, okay, this is what we then tried to do, the first step I took in the European Parliament was to come forward just to put it on the agenda, because it was not on the agenda. Okay, we need to ban tracking ads. We need to stop this. Of course, I knew that it was gonna be a long fight, and this was probably not the end result of that fight, but to get it on the agenda, just, we need to ban this. But when you say that 
nine, more than 90% of their revenue comes from advertising, well, you shouldn't treat them as an advertising agency, um, right? Yeah, exactly. But that makes it a bit more complex than your other company that makes money off of advertising. Well, it's not, I'm not sure it's more complicated because now it becomes interesting because I started like with with the, the ban on tracking so they don't yeah. collect all the personal data and have the algorithm you geared to your to keep you, uh, to, get, to get and keep your attention. And then I, um, but I also start to study um, uh, the, the, the digital advertising market. And that is real surprising because it was not just that they are very good in their algorithms to get and keep our attention. Google also builds a dominant position in the digital advertising market. Hardly any studies have been done. I've been a study in the UK and Australia on the digital advertising market where you start to look and you don't have to be an economist to understand it. They dominate every bit and piece of the uh, advertising market. So you have the suppliers of advertising space, room, so these are usually the publishers, they are organized. Then we have the demands for uh, advertisers, usually these are like Procter and Campbell and Unilever. And then there is this um, um, uh, tiling, sorry, uh, um, auction. auction, thank you, I'm looking for that word. It's pretty ingenious, by the way, because it's very quick. Every time you open up your the website or, or your browser, there is, there is an auction going on and it's done in milliseconds, so it's pretty ingenious. But who owns both the supply side organization, the demand side organization, and the auction? It's Google. And now we are back. Again, I don't need to understand technology to understand that something. This is market dominance. So, and there is, and Google is completely dominating this market for, uh, for digital it's advertising. A huge player. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with which I've been discussing with one of the, the colleagues here, Marta Peter Schinkel, because it's not just, again, it's not about technology, it's about competition policy. What are we going to do about it? Yeah. yeah. Um, before we head into some of the uh, regulatory efforts from Brussels, Maybe we could look at the audience to see if there's a question already uh, for Paul Tan. Yeah, one here with the white shirt. Yeah, so I might be running a bit ahead of things, um, but one thing I noticed back in March when the earnings call for Facebook came around, they noted a big decline in their uh, profits which they mainly base on the fact that Apple has started integrating uh, tracking blockers in their iOS system. How does it make you feel as someone who makes public policy that ends up being private policy by another big tech company that ends up being a great factor in helping to fight this endless data collection? Yeah, it was an interesting case. It just showed it was in fact the track that we followed in the European Parliament. Like I said, band tracking ads, so it's the tracking and targeting and the, the and in fact there are the, the personal data are collected and what we have now and as end result like I started I started in 2019 with this ban on tracking ads and we ended up with um, not a ban but really a, li a, li a limited ban on sensitive personal data like your health status your political persuasion your religious beliefs they're not allowed to use that uh, anymore um, and to have clear consent. A bit like Apple does, right? The reason why I, ch oh, by the way, it's one of the reasons why I changed to Apple. I, u I usually use Android, but this, this feature of Apple I wanted to have. So I changed, which is difficult, by the way. Um, and, but it's, of course, if you look at the business model of Apple, it doesn't, the business model of Apple is you, you some of you love the hardware, the phones and the iPads, so that's, and the other part is the App Store, where you have to you see that uh, Fortnite, what is the company uh, that runs Fortnite, uh, Epic, thank you, uh, starting a law, like I said, it's the American way, you go to court, so uh, 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 Epic going to court against Apple because of the margins on the App Store. Again, there you see it's competition policy uh, around, uh, and so it helps us to show, and so I thought it was very good to see that Apple was taking on this fight, uh, but it also, because it also showed that we're exactly on the right track. Start, track, uh, stop the tracking and the targeting of people, because Facebook is scared for that. It's interesting to see that 
this public uh, role is also taken by these private companies. But I think we'll get into that yeah. uh, a bit later as well. Um, so Brussels and the EP and the Commission and, uh, is working on new legislation, um, most notably the Digital Markets Act and the Digital, Digital Service Act, um, of which the Digital Markets Act has been coined by the New York Times as um, the most sweeping legislation to regulate tech since the 2008 privacy laws. Do you agree? Yeah, I agree. What makes it so but, sweeping? But then again, we also learned from the GDPR. The GDPR was introduced in 2018, yeah. May 2018. You also need good enforcement of the GDPR. And one thing that has changed, for example, the GDPR uh, is uh, partly or mostly enforced by the IRIS supervisor, so the Data Protection Board, the Autoriteit Persoonsgegevens. Um, now, the IRIS supervisor needs to supervise Google and Facebook because they are formally located in Dublin. Right? And here we have a supervisor that is very um, uh, sort of generous towards Google and Facebook. This is the business model, has been the business model uh, of Ireland. It's similar like Netherlands and, uh, and Luxembourg. Low taxation, good conditions, come to us, right? Ireland is all over that. And very effectively, if you look at the foreign direct investment in Ireland, it's been stunning and it has had led to a great catching up of Ireland over the years in uh, when they become member of the European Union. So you understand that thinking. But here you have the problem that we have now an Irish supervisor that is captured by, their, uh, by Google and Facebook. So one of the changes that we made was to make sure that we have European supervision in that. Because this is the trick in Europe. What you often see is that we have European legislation. Uh, the, the member states don't really like that, that because that means that their competences lie in Brussels. So they want to keep some of the competences and you have the supervision, the enforcement of legislation is in the, uh, the member states. So remember the, 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 the diesel gate, right? Uh, the polluting uh, German diesel cars obscured by software because it was a European legislation but it was supervised and it needed to be enforced by the German supervisor. So where do you think it was uncovered, the, 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 the German software? In the US. Of course not by the German supervisor. They're too lenient. Yeah. 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 Let's, let's uh, get back to uh, the digital um, legislation yeah. working on. Um, so we have these two new laws uh, which are being worked on. Could you quickly explain like, what, is, what is in the two sentence, three sentence the difference between the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Service Act? The Digital Market Act is for the largest gatekeeper to be determined but roughly eight, Google, Facebook um, uh, and so on, um, Apple, Amazon. So those are the big, the big fish? the gatekeepers, and they get uh, behavioral, you could call it behavioral remedy. Like, for example, you, can't, you cannot self-preference. Sounds a bit obvious, but if you have a platform and you also supply services on the same platform that you run, there might be, there's this conflict of interest, right? So these are behavioral remedies for the largest gatekeeper. Yeah. The Digital Service Act is more the, the rules for everyone, which starts, for example, what is illegal offline should be uh, illegal online. Fair enough, right? But we don't enforce it up to now. And applies much more broadly by having uh, more transparency for, every, uh, for everyone. So we'll notice much more of the DSA than of the DNA, you think? Well, I think the major impact now on our digital life is from big tech, really. So I think there are, um, and in fact, if you want to have new developments, uh, I think the Digital Market Act is pretty important. Um, for example, I was, does anyone use Proton Mail or what? Yeah, you do, right? I do too. You're not a paying user, right? Are you not? No, no, nor am I, by the way. Uh, so this is a starting company that, pri that promises privacy. So they have end-to-end -end encryption on mail, for example. So this is a European startup, not, well, startup, 400 FTEs. And he said, and, and when I had a discussion with the CEO, uh, he said, just give me one thing, a level playing field. Because now I'm being swamped, uh, I have no 
way to fight the Gmail or whatever other mail services from the big tech there is. Uh, just give us a level playing field. So I think it's also, so you, sometimes you need to break down to really, to really build again. And so don't forget, one thing we couldn't really do in the DMA because it's harmonization of law, it's not about competition policy, but one is the, the aggressive takeovers by Google and Facebook. Yeah. So you had Eric Schmidt who was boasting, saying, we buy one company each day. It turns out, okay, it was exaggerating a bit, it was each week. But it just shows what they do. They just buy their competition. And all say, saying, well, this is very innovative. We bought this innovative firm. But in the end, of course, it's just buying your competition. It's a bit like Facebook buying Instagram because Instagram is growing very, much more rapidly than Facebook. Who uses Facebook anymore? Well, I do, but because I'm 50, but you don't, right? Because you're, 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 you're in your 20s. Oh, that, that's the problem of Facebook. And they so keep they that position. Very good. They keep the position on yeah. the market. Yeah. Exactly. Earlier you already mentioned um, that the algorithm feeds on attention. That basically they show us information that's emotional, divisive, yeah. and that keep us engaged with it. And prior up to that, the content moderation has always been a big topic. And the tech companies were pretty much left by their own devices. Um, some had their own um, human raters that flag content or look over it. Um, but prior to that, it was privately enforced pretty much. So with the DSA, um, there is transparency on how those decisions are made. And do you think that private companies should be in charge of that, of a public goods such as free speech? Very good question. Uh, this is, and this is all about Elon Musk buying Twitter, right? And saying, we're going to allow Donald Trump back on Twitter. Um, I don't think it's the most important issue what is being said, or what is being heard, so to say. It's not about, you can say everything, but if you say it in, uh, let's say it, uh, you can say it to your, uh, you can say it in the, in the bathroom, no one hears, no one, so it's, you, in that sense you have freedom of speech. More important than freedom of speech, who is being heard? It's, it's like writing a letter to, uh, to the newspaper and saying, you, you don't expect this letter to be published, right? So you can write a letter, but it's freedom of speech. No one expects it to be published. But this is what is happening with the, uh, with the, uh, with the algorithms of Twitter and, uh, and Facebook and YouTube. Um, they show the content that leads to disagreement, right? Mm. And this is how it's um, so much more important than is Donald Trump on Twitter. What is being shown on your Twitter feed? So I have somehow, over the years, I follow 1,500 people on Twitter. I can't <laughs> so there must be some sort of, uh, there must be a timeline. And to have this timeline, you need to make choices. It's moderated, the timeline. And that is much more important for the impact of Twitter than the fact that someone can or cannot tweet. So I think that, and take it, for example, if you buy a newspaper, you buy a timeline. It's a newspaper is just a timeline. You expect from the, from the editors to make their choices, and you want them to make their choices. You don't want to read every letter by every stupid... Okay. So this is what you... And you can choose. You can have a more left-wing leaning uh, timeline. You can have a more right-wing leaning timeline. In the Netherlands, you would do false contrast instead of graphs. Um, and this is what we miss on Twitter. So there's just one Twitter. And, wh and one of the things that I tried and I failed to do in a digital market act is, now we come back to the technology, is interoperability. What I wanted to have is there are different providers of different timelines, like the newspaper. So the problem is, one thing is one thing that Elon Musk buys Twitter. This is a concentration of money and power. I don't like the idea that these billionaires can have a scoop, uh, get all the, get all the, get all the money and the power uh, with that, sort of that makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, but the, the problem is that there is no competition, no diversity in is, there. Is that competition, you just mentioned this Proton service, and it's it's the scale up, um, it's you use it, somebody in the audience uses it, uh, why can't we leave it up to this level playing field that they're asking for, 
in these markets. You need open standards. So with email, we have no problem. You don't know even know the, or with the telephone, you don't know the provider. If you call someone, you don't know the provider of the other, right? You simply don't know. And you don't want to know. Um, and with interoperability, you, you need to have open standards so that everyone can, um, uh, can provide a different timeline. Of course, the big tech doesn't want need, but doesn't want this because it's their business model to keep it to themselves, right? Because they need to, s to get and keep your attention, they need to sell the ads. That's how it works. But that is, that is one of the crucial issues that we still face, is that we, we have the discussion on Donald Trump because we have little, uh, little choice in our timeline. So you could, it could be there, it could be, let's say there are 10 timelines, 10 forms of Twitter, uh, one of the, in one of the timelines you see Donald Trump and the other nine you don't. It would be a very different discussion on the freedom of speech. This freedom of speech discussion arises because we just have one Twitter. And in, in choosing this timeline, I think a good example is um, what we saw during uh, the COVID pandemic um, with these theories of it, the COVID of being man-made or not man-made and yeah. Facebook uh, first disallowing and then allowing these theories to circulate. Um, so, would that mean that if you allow these different timelines that you can choose to have uh, these type of theories in your timeline or not? Or would that be possibly the European Union choosing for you what you can see or cannot see? No, the, the last is not, right? So, the, the European Union is very clear. We just, if it's illegal, then we step in. We're it's, not going to... It's disinformation. We're not, and we're, we're banning, for right? example, news right. media from, from the Russian Federation on basis Yeah, but, of but this is, comes to the... And this is why it's important. To, if you want to look at Russia today, I would... And would be inclined to say, okay, you, you can do that if you want to. Uh, so I'm that sense, I'm for free speech. But usually I don't think that people are going to watch Russia today, so that's not my main concern, really. Mm. If you were talking about alternative kind of timelines to show yeah. to the users, what do you think, what consequences does it have on public discourse? Because it offers free speech, so everybody can post. However, we see different versions of the reality in yeah. a sense. Now, and the, this is... This is a, Again, so the, the, the concern is, so now we see that, we see the fragmentation and the polarization in our society, and I can't help to think, and I'm not the only one to think that, that it has its impact on society. Uh, the use of social media has this impact on society, because this is what social media is about. It's about being different than the other, belonging to a different group. So we need this fragmentation, we get this fragmentation and this polarization in, um, so I think it will change if the, um, if the timelines are not just based on commercial motives, getting and keeping attention, mm -hmm. but we will restore some of the editorial independence that you see in newspapers. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't different timelines arguably create a more diversive sense? Because everybody yeah. would be more in their bubble because they say, mm -hmm. The predetermined kind of what they want more left leaning but, or but right still, leaning. I'm not sure how you do that, but I still people are still uh, are not usually not confined to one bubble. Mm -hmm. um, so even in my time in my timeline on Twitter, I follow some very right wing populists. Yeah, they annoy them. I, they annoy me, but still, I want to see what they are saying, mm -hmm. so to say. So it's not depends. On it. But yeah, people could be in the bubble, but that's that's a fact of life. If people have no interest in the world. I've got to be in a bubble. Mm. All right. Um, so we talked about different regulatory strategies the EU is currently pursuing. Um, do you think that other countries will follow the regulatory examples of the EU? So will kind of a Brussels effect so that companies will apply EU standards all over the world will also take place in tech? I think so. Uh, one of the elements that, uh, which I find very interesting, which is in the digital service sector, I've discussed, let's say, the, the tracking and targeting which I think is important, interoperability, which, okay, we didn't win the fight, but it's on the agenda, uh, at least interoperability between WhatsApp and Signal. Uh, but one of the other elements that was already brought forward by the Commission, which I think is very good, there need to be a risk assessment of the, uh, of the algorithms. So you need to show what are the consequences, the risk of this algorithm, and how do I address this risk? And this applies, for example, to Twitter. How does it di di how does it disseminate disinformation, and what, do you, what does Twitter do, uh, get, uh, do against that? But it also applies to TikTok, where 13-year-olds uh, can be on 
uh, on TikTok and adults approach these youngsters. So that's a common problem with TikTok. Com uh, TikTok needs to acknowledge those risks and tell uh, and tell how they address these risks. So that's also a major innovation. I think. Yeah, I think. But I think when when we take a look at this risk assessment and this transparency towards consumers, um, it does really make me think about the GDPR legislation as well and how nowadays we have, whenever you enter a website, you have to click uh, away this pop-up for cookies. Yeah. Um, so. This seems like more of an administrative hassle that, you know, I absentmindedly click away this pop-up and I dare to say 99% of the people in this building do the same. Yeah. Um, I, so I, how effective is, is it Twitter telling me, oh, your timeline is based on X, Y, and Z, and me just clicking OK? No, but that has or changed, that right? So what I think the, the, the discourse was we need to leave it to the individual to decide. And this is where the click, uh, the cookies, yeah. cookie yeah. laws come from. And there's been a complete disaster, right? I've become, by the way, so aware of the use of personal data that I've, I'm, a bit, I'm becoming a bit of a nerd. I sometimes go, what is behind it? Who is it? So, okay, but that's me. That's, uh, I, I don't expect my mother to do that or, or my sister, so to say. Uh, so we need to, so what we see here is a set of obligations and limitations on the companies or on the sector, which is much better. So it doesn't have to be a uh, individual choice to make a collective good, right? So this is, I think no yeah. one wants children to get abused because of TikTok. That's the first uh, responsibility lies first with TikTok, not with the parents or with the children or with others. Yeah. Do you think this will be achieved with the DMA and DSA? Well, the one thing that we learned from the GDPR, because the GDPR itself is good, but you need to have it enforced, and the enforcement is now at the European level and not at the national level. So that's a step forward. Yeah. Um, so we talked about talking a lot about this uh, technological regulation and big tech, and when I think about what the big tech of now and of tomorrow is, I immediately think about cryptocurrency. Um, so you could say that cryptocurrency is today what big tech was 20 years ago in a way, uh, but then on payment uh, technology. We'll see. Um, yeah, we'll see. Um, <laughs> is this cryptocurrency, uh, is that also this question of uh, this public good in private hands um, in the way we just talked about the DMA DSA? Yeah, I think Ru wanted to ask a question. Maybe she can say we take this question first because he has to leave also. We can take a question, definitely. Yeah, I think there's another microphone coming Sorry, right sorry for interrupting, but yeah, we'll, we'll, no, we'll keep point. the question in mind, sorry. Uh, I'm very fascinated, uh, Paul, but I was wondering, I mean, the Commission is now playing also with the idea, and maybe they've already implemented some of this, of outright banning of this, this information, just lies, eh, on social media, etc. How do you think about that? I mean, just you know, wrong information on vaccination or those, those things. How, how, what's your position well, on this? Uh, in fact, the commission doesn't really ban unless it's really uh, 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 detrimental to public health or uh, so the, it must be, you should go to court and win the case, right? So in that sense, like I said, what is illegal offline should be uh, illegal online, right? So that's the, that's the principle. However, there is, of course, uh, this is why there's the, the risk assessment by, of the algorithms. If Twitter accepts the responsibility for fighting this information, then Twitter needs to address how it's going to fight this information. That's the way, and that is a form of, which is an odd form, by the way, it's a form of co-regulation. So we have a code of conduct where uh, the, the, the big tech sits together with the commission and discuss what are the risks and how are they going to be addressed? And this is also going to be, this code of conduct is going to be part of the digital service. I tell you, co-regulation, hmm, I'm not sure about this concept, by the way. Uh, so let's, let's be careful uh, with that. Uh, but it, it shows that the, the, the Commission and Parliament are very careful not to step into the, we talk about illegal content, and then we have a discussion on harmful content. But that is not for politicians to decide. So we try to find ways to have this discussion on harmful content, but put it more into obli uh, self-imposed obligations of the big tech. Because this harmful content is part of the regulation. It is in there, and it is in, no, there, in, no, in, no, a, in, a, in a vague manner. No, it's not in there, no, sorry. 
No, and it's we'll really take a look after the, uh, no, 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 after no, the no, no, This yeah. is one of his... It, it surprised me a bit, by the way, that it didn't... Because, of course, you can have good arguments uh, why we want to uh, dis address disinformation, be it on COVID or be it on the invasion in Ukraine. You can have good arguments for that, but in fact, the European Parliament and the Commission and the countries shied away from that. So there may be some sort of recitals in there, but yeah. nothing, uh, nothing really crazy. Um, it's still interesting, the DMA is a, but I think, yeah, we, we have to go to the crypto. tech up tomorrow, crypto. Yeah. This um, public good, so private maybe hands. Qu quickly repeat, I, I interrupt yeah. you, so otherwise for the... Of course, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the question is whether this is, again, uh, a recital of what we've seen with big tech, and if this is also this question of a public good in private hands and how we should approach that. Yeah, well, let me first explain what why I became quickly number enemy number one of the crypto sector. So we have this very boring, or it seems very boring, uh, regulation, and it's called transfer of funds. Yeah, you sorry, you fall asleep when you hear that, I understand. But it's all about um, collecting information that go together with, uh, with transactions, payment, so you, if you will, transfers from, we have that for banks, and we want to introduce that for in the crypto sector itself, uh, also. So it's a, we just treat them equally. So banks transfer uh, uh, need to have the info, the the information. Know your customer. We apply the same principle in the, in the crypto sector. Uh, then we came to the issue of unhosted wallets. So you have these regulated providers, crypto as a service providers, and we then said, okay, but there are people that are going in and out. And we need to identify with unhosted wallets. And we want to. It's a bit technical. Now it's a bit, it becomes a bit technical, yeah. but it's saying, can you be anonymous or not? And we say, no, you cannot. And then the crypto sector exploded. Because part of it, part of this crypto sector is, is very decentralized. It's also very libertarian, I would say. It's, it, in that sense, it's very American in its, in its nature, I would say. So, and libertarians are shy of any government interference, any government interference they see as surveillance. Right? So that's sort of, so part of this sector really well, exploded and uh, came after me at, uh, I think we had a tweet I was looking at Abel, I think there was sort of, what was it? I think, uh, 500,000 views on, uh, on Twitter because I said something on crypto. It's not my usual day, so to, so to say that I uh, have a tweet that is seen so many times. Uh, but it was all the crypto sector aiming at me, saying, from calling me from being stupid to saying, compare me to Joseph Kubo, Kibble. It doesn't really, it didn't really affect me that, that much, I must say. It's just, I kind of did annoy to say, if this is your reaction, because this is discussion on anti-money laundering, but you also see the discussion on energy use and Bitcoin, right? You see, the, so the problem this is this, this, this sector, the, 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 I'm sorry, I don't know my point. This sector is started with very decentralized concept of financing in reaction to the financial crisis. I see that. I understand they are annoyed with the banks. I get that. Uh, but they are very decentralized in the setup. But now they have public goals and they need to come up with collective solutions like fighting any money laundering, li uh, making sure that, uh, that Bitcoin and other crypto also become sustainable. And that, you find this sector find this very difficult because they are very decentralized by nature. Yeah. But yeah. listening to something that you said earlier, and both transparency and privacy are something that's important to you as well as to the EU, and both are key elements of the big, uh, blockchain technology underlying crypto. So maybe there are benefits to a decentralized governance system after all. Well, you don't want to give uh, leeway, every uh, leeway to uh, organized crime, to corrupt oligarchs, uh, to, to terrorists, sorry. Even when, you, even when they use crypto, they, they should not be get away with that. So here you have indeed a trade-off between so collective security and personal privacy, and with the anti-money laundering, you try to find a balance by, let's say, storing the data and analyzing the data in an in in between um, uh, in between room, which is called financial intelligence unit. 
So the, the, the suspicious transactions are, uh, are reported by the banks. And before they go to law enforcement, they are analyzed first by the Financial Intelligence Unit. And this is how you try to solve the issue of collective security and the personal privacy. This also applies to crypto, sorry. You're not gonna get everyone away the, with, with the benefits of their crime or corruption. This is, and in fact, um, I think Beth Slachter will be here discussing this with- um, Beth Slachter on stage, yes. With Arnold Dodd here two weeks from now. Um, I had a podcast with Beth uh, last Tuesday, and Beth is very much a fan of Bitcoin, no doubt, but he has no problem subscribing to the point that you can't get criminals and, uh, and corrupt oligarchs get away with it. So they just think, so. but then the problem is how to get it organized. Okay, so moving on, besides regulation, your work in the parliament also tackles the issue of taxes and big tech. So everyone knows about Luxembourg, Bermuda, and even the Netherlands, in your words, as tax havens. And now we'd like to talk about the efforts to eradicate tax havens, and especially through the currently planned global minimum corporate tax. Yeah. Which is a plan from the, the OECD, but is also talked about in Europe. Sure. Um, so it's set at 15%. Uh, however, when we take a look at the worldwide average tax rate for corporates, it's around 23.5%. Um, why is it not at 23.5%? Good question. And, and notice that what, what I, most of the work that I do is sort of, is try to supply public goods at the European level, at the global level, because let's say big tech is, glo big tech is global, crypto is global, tax avoidance is global. Right, so, and we have a huge undersupply of all the public goods that we find in our own country, but not at the supranational level. So that's the reason why, uh, it's just in the, in the three mile line. Why is it not, um, basically because many countries, uh, and then just uh, have had already had a rate much lower than 15%. Of course, the most obvious one is Ireland with 12.5%. But you had Bulgaria and Hungary with uh, eight or nine percent. Uh, so raising this minimum and an effective minimum, if it is, uh, is already a huge change for some of these countries. And so it's and if you see it as a race to the bottom, and it's fair, it's pretty fair to see that uh, because if you look at the marginal tax rates in the uh, marginal corporate tax rate that are declining over time. That's, by the way, how I started this work. I worked at the Central Planning Bureau, which is a research institute. I worked together with Ruth Moy, who was studying this, and he already saw the dynamics. So when I went to the national parliament in 2007, I was sort of equipped based on a graph on economic analysis that we need to turn this ra ra race to the yeah. bottom around. Yeah. Uh, and what it does is, is affect, so you keep the, the, the system intact, you can have more drastic changes, more, uh, uh, let's say, conceptual changes in the corporate tax system, but you keep the system as it is and you put just put a floor in the race to the bottom. But I, when I see this 15%, I think now you're still in negotiation, there's still leeway, but once you set it at 15, if you knock on uh, Bermuda's door next week or Ireland or Hungary and say, hey, can we go to 16 next year? They'll say, no, the deal's a deal. So are we not going to be stuck at 15? Uh, well, okay, the, the, the bad thing in a sense is it's still the old system. And the old system has, has, be, has become outdated. So for you to understand, take the example of Nike. Nike in Europe. Nike uh, sells most of its uh, gear, uh, shoes, shirts, and in the largest countries, right? In, in, the, in France and in Germany. France and Germany also have the highest corporate tax rate. This is what the shareholders of Nike don't like. So they transfer all the profits, no problem, within the current system, this is completely legal, they transfer it to a European headquarter in Hilfsen. So all, so it seems like the, the Nike doesn't make any profits in uh, Germany and France, make all the profits in the Netherlands. And then what happens, they have this intellectual property that is stored, that is located in Bermuda. So the profits go from the Netherlands to Bermuda. This is the system, and this is, I think, a very, and that has become more uh, prominent because we have these uh, intangible assets like intellectual property, finance structure, 
and it makes it possible for companies to locate where they make profits and where they have their profits. So that makes the current corporate tax system completely out of date in my mind. So you could you need a change in you could you have now the origin principle which comes back from 1919. Well, maybe in 2022 is good to start with the destination principle. Okay. So you need a fundamental change. If you don't have this fundamental change, the next best thing is uh, having this minimum tax rate because you don't need to agree with the Cayman Islands. You can have a coalition of countries saying, we're going to impose from now on 21%. And if it's not 21% in the Cayman Islands, we make sure that the company that's located in the Cayman Islands still pays 21%. So you need a coalition of countries. Top up. A top up. And this, yeah. is, this is the good thing about this proposal. It's about, the, it's not about, it's not an, um, conceptual or a legal argument, it's a political economy argument. We can always have this coalition and so I expect we will have in the future also the discussion on a higher tax rate. Okay, so you say it is, it is actually enforceable through this top of taxation, essentially, but uh, when countries don't levy the minimum rate, the home country uh, can levy a tax on the remaining part, basically, yeah. the way you just explained it. Um, but what is the effect of this top of taxation for developing countries? since most of the headquarters are based in rich Western ones. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, I think what we have seen in negotiation, I think 140 countries subscribed to the OECD deal. Four did not, I think it was Nigeria, Argentina, I believe, or maybe Argentina subscribed. Uh, but some of the developing countries were protesting uh, 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 against it. And I think with a, with a good reason, indeed, like you said, that most of it's um, in this initial rule, um, goes to the to the rich countries. There has been a debate though where they can sort of skim part of the profits that are related to that. If that's enough or not, I would like to think not. But that's also a political discussion. But it just shows that um, to have to arrive at a at a fair international deal, maybe you should extend the deal as much as possible. Of course, we've now started with the OECD, which is the club of rich countries. Okay. So that, that's the weakness still in, but I think in the setting itself, they can discuss uh, different types of values of distribution between the rich and uh, the developed countries. You were already uh, saying disagreements between different countries. So on the 24th, that's next week Tuesday, the EU ministers of finance will vote on implementing this plan into EU legislation. And Poland is infamous for blocking the legislation so far. And their visa costs the EU 60 billion per year in your words. Do you think they will vote in favor on Tuesday? I don't know yet. It's just going to be, but this shows the weakness of Europe. So when you ask people, what does Europe need to do? Well, we need to have a common foreign policy, right? Because, hey, what can the Netherlands do it on its own? We need a common foreign policy. We need to climate policy. Obviously, you can't do it on your own. Uh, we need, uh, and all that implies also energy policy. We need to fight international crime, right? Because international crime crosses borders. Oh, we want to f uh, fight tax avoidance, absolutely. So people all expect this from the European Union. And I would say that is pretty obvious. There's a good argument to make to do that, at, not at a national, but at a supranational level. But Europe is not allowed to do that. So on taxation, it's still the competences, the unique competences of the member states, giving a country like Poland a veto. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, stops, uh, well, changes of, and in this case, it's pretty, uh, pretty bad because it's not just that Poland blocks a European agreement, but uh, Janet Yellen also visited Poland last yeah. week, this week, actually, to argue for uh, Poland accepting it. Why? Because we also need some of the changes in, in Congress, in the American Congress. So they need to raise the, we already have a minimum tax that's called guilty in the US. The US needs to raise it as part of the deal with the OECD. And Janet Yellen very much fears that if Europe doesn't come to an agreement, if Poland doesn't agree, this will backfire in Congress also when, because there are elections coming up. So this could, um, so there, people are really now getting nervous about what will happen to the international deal. If Poland doesn't accept, Europe doesn't accept, and the American Congress doesn't accept, then we're far away from us. So we're, we're getting a bit nervous. We still have some time, 
but there's only one way out, that is that Poland accepts the minimum tax cut. So I, I, I hear, and what you say, I hear, uh, let's say, two solutions or two ways to go ahead. One is this sort of fiscal integration and fiscal authority in Europe, um, and also this cooperation or push from maybe more powerful countries um, that need to take this leading role. Yeah, um, both, I think so. Yeah, so th those are the solutions, and that's the way forward in your opinion. Yeah, I think it, it's, um, um, and, I, and I think for Europe to make um, to make headway, I think it would be good to have this, uh, to drop the veto and go to majority or qualified majority voting. Uh, because the, the Netherlands um, being also infamous for uh, being a tax haven or not being a tax haven, yeah. um, you're in a position from Brussels, uh, how do you see another way to influence these member states except trying to become a fiscal authority? Well, what we try to do, what I've tried to do through the years, and I started in the Dutch Parliament, uh, and I continue to work on that in the European Parliament, is to, uh, sorry, this is all I have, is to, to name and shame. I consistently sort of went after, uh, with a moral agenda, because people understand that, and a, a moral agenda after the the tax policy in the Netherlands. And it's not what I sort of like, but what I needed to do is to get it on the agenda, to get people aware what is going on in our own country, right? So, and by the way, it's, it's a trait of the Dutch that they think, I think it's, it's a, up to a point a healthy characteristic, but people in the Netherlands think highly of themselves. Oh, we're pretty good. Well. Sometimes maybe not, and this is a very hard message to tell to the Dutch people. Um, I think Belgians think the Dutch are a bit arrogant. I now understand why, because we think highly of ourselves. But in fact, we are we're one of the tax havens in Europe. Everyone who knew knew that, except the Dutch themselves. Uh, we're one of the most dirtiest countries still when it comes to sustainable energy. Well, of course, we're catching up. Hey, but we're catching up from the last place, together with Malta. So it's so our self-image is sometimes is good, which is psychologically healthy, but it's sometimes a bit narcissistic also, I would say. And just a couple of months ago, the Dutch State Secretary of Finance still disagreed that the Netherlands could be classified as a, a tax haven. So we're not yeah. there yet, I think. No, no, no. And I think, but I, I do think the Netherlands is changing. Uh, yes. And I very much hope so. Um, Have yes, you noticed that? that? Well. The verdict is out there, right? So in that sense, this is the discussion I had also with the, the uh, with Manix van Rij. Uh, say, okay, we are, we are making change, and I say, yeah, well, the proof's in eating of the pudding. Look at the foreign direct investment. It's something odd. If you look at foreign direct investment, you see countries like Luxembourg and the Netherlands together have more incoming foreign direct investment than the entire U.S. economy. What? Luxembourg is 600,000 people, Netherlands 70 million, versus the 250 million people in the US. So what's going on? And that is, so you see a lot of them, uh, a lot of these investments are, uh, I call them paper investment, or yeah. the IMF calls them phantom investment. It's just on transactions on paper. So I argue with, uh, with Manish Farai, what we need to have is to have a reduction in foreign direct investment. So this is where we still, but I do think there is a change in policy ongoing in the Netherlands. Uh, and I very much hope for that because there are still two important tax havens less and I very much hope that the Netherlands will join me in fighting Luxembourg and the islands. So that would be good. A good perspective. Should we do questions from the audience? Let's see uh, a hand in the back in the middle, the blue shirt. Uh, so on the one hand, you uh, seem to very keen to limit the way uh, big tech companies can exploit their business models in Europe and well, mainly Europe. And on the other hand, you seem to be very supportive of the OECD's plan to um, tax big tech companies at the place where they uh, generate their revenue. So the OECD's pillar one, the safety pillar two, which is the test. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to limit their business models and at the same time tax their business models, are those two things? Uh, able to exist at the same time. I'm very curious about that. Okay, interesting. Um, but I don't think, in the end, 
Okay, I'm going to shy away from your dilemma, to be honest, because in the end, <laughs> uh, the, the agreement in the OECD called Pillar 1 was from at an American uh, background and avoided to really focus on big tech. So, as an array, uh, a short, a short of his, uh, bit of history, the idea of uh, Europe had the idea of a digital service tax that really came from Paris. They wanted a CAFA tax, as they call the French call it. So that came the European tax, the European digital service tax. That brought back the US to the table from the OECD negotiation because the Americans feared, okay, there's these guys, these boys and girls in Europe are really serious about taxing our big, big tech companies. We need better get on the table. That was under the Trump administration. Um, and when the Biden administration, the, there was a new proposal on the table, it say it should be confined to the large, 100 largest multinationals, which of, includes, let's say, BMW or um, any other European multinational. So I don't think it's because it's no longer a, a real tax on uh, on uh, on big tech because this is exactly what the U.S. wanted to avoid. It would be seen in the American Congress as anti-American, and this is why it's off the table. Uh, so that's one way, and the second way to shy away from your dilemma, so I'm like, is to say, well, these, these companies are among the biggest in the world, right? Before we could, um, these are the most profitable companies in the world, and profit margins are huge. So I don't think it's very difficult to make, to impoverish them by taxing them a bit, actually. So that's the profit. My concern is mainly, this is why I brought up competition policy. We need to reduce uh, their profit margin. Just, I've got to mention, this is one of my favorite metrics. It's by the, the, the English uh, Competition Authority. They estimate that of every euro spent in advertisement, in digital ad advertisement, 50 cents end up in the pockets of Facebook and Google. 50 cents, that's a huge margin. That's the main problem. I think we started a bit late, so we can have like one more question from the audience, probably. I saw a hand in the back in the corner there. Oh, uh, hi, Paul. Thank you for your explanation. Um, a great question from, from the guys on the bench was about crypto, um, and I would like to, to ask a question about this. Um, so at this moment, um, the, Mika, the Mika regulation is, is on point and is uh, going to be addressed, uh, uh, I think, in 2024. Are you not afraid that people who are um, behind those uh, laws, who don't, script, who don't understand crypto that well, that those people are uh, going to uh, bring Bitcoin uh, to, to, to the ground, to, to, to make it fill? Because the p potential it has is, of course, great. Uh, what are your, yeah, your take on that? Okay, this is... Like I said, this is the technolo uh, technology confusion that is often used to, uh, to obstruct politicians. For example, what does Mika do? Mika is on the regulation of, uh, it regulates stable coins. So we now have uh, uh, Terra and Luna collapsing, the algorithm stable coins. We have Tether on the brink of collapsing. And, and Tether is more interesting in a sense than Terra, then, because Terra and Luna didn't, the Terra uh, stablecoin didn't have much backup, I think. But Tether is supposed to have this, um, uh, this collateral available, right? Either in hard currency or in other cryptocurrencies. But no one knows. So this is a strange, so you have a stablecoin which is, may, it seems to have a systemic role in the cryptocurrency, in the world of cryptocurrency, but we don't know what their collateral is. Sorry, if we start to regulate that, I think that's in the best interest of this sector. And I don't understand that the sector can be felt by not, uh, by not having transparency on what is behind Tether. Now, it might turn out that they don't have enough collateral, so to say, it's not backed up enough, and that it might go down, and then the, the problems are even bigger, because I believe that for cryptocurrencies to work, it needs to be much more stable. And one of the successful projects in Europe is the Euro, which has brought exchange rate stability. You don't even know, because you're too young, probably, you don't even know what it was to have speculative attacks 
uh, it made people li like George Soros rich, but it also added very much to the uncertainty. So we had many crises. We had the Brexit. Uh, I would say crisis was also that Donald Trump was elected, but um, uh, we had uh, the COVID crisis. We had uh, the, the war in Ukraine. This uh, could all be compounded by exchange rate crisis. That is gone. And that's a good thing. Now, so I think stable coins are essential for crypto to work. I'm not sure that crypto is going to work, by the way. I'm, I prefer to be agnostic. You can, but I'm pretty sure if it's not stable, it can't uh, perform the function of means of exchange. Then it's just a store of value. Store of value is boring. We, can, we had speculation in tulip bulbs in the 17th century. So it's no need for more speculative, uh, for more speculation. The only thing, the interesting thing, if you have the means, is a means to exchange coins. But then it needs to be stable, and I think it's not currently it's too unstable still. Fine, but I think regulation can help here because the weakness of the crypto sector is they are poorly organized because they are decentralized. And sometimes you need to have a public good like financial stability. How is the crypto sector going to provide that? Well, thanks to us. Okay, they don't realize it yet. That's the only thing. <laughs> I'm just joking with that. Sorry for that. And that's an interesting uh, perspective. Oh, the idea that I might save crypto. That's <laughs> so, I'm not sure I want that. Something to look forward to, I think, in the coming years. Um, I'd like to see the headlines. Um, I think that's also a moment to close out this interview. We've run out of time, unfortunately. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for coming to the room for discussion. You're alma mater at the yes. University of Amsterdam. It's great to be back home. Thank yeah. you very much for your attention. Upcoming interviews yeah. we're going to have. Oh, well, we have a big <laughs> round of applause, of course, for Mr. Falcon. Definitely. Thank you. Be sure to take a look at our upcoming interviews this afternoon at 3 p.m. So in about 50 minutes, we're going to have the... Uh, uh.